Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are in the world. Welcome back to The Caring Economy with me, Toby Usnick. Today is a particularly special day and guest because I'm having as a, as a guest my new colleague, Hannah Young. Hannah Young is the Deputy Consul General for the British Consul General in New York. She is also now my official colleague because in addition to hosting The Caring Economy, I'm now the head of communications for the British Consul General in New York. And <laughs> it's an honor and a privilege to have you here, Hannah Young. So welcome to The Caring Economy. Thank you, Toby. It's a real privilege to be here. Hannah, I, um, early in my career, I took the foreign service exam a few times, the oral exams. I thought that I would begin my career in the foreign service. Now I find myself toward the latter part of my career actually in the foreign service of sorts, but it's not my own nation, it's Her Majesty's government. So it, it's <laughs> thrilling for me and to get to know you even better makes me feel all the more like I'm coming home. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your career journey when you were that young person starting out? And in particular, my guests like to hear about the pivots along the way. Why did you choose to go left when others went right? Why did you pick yourself up by the boots and carry on when you could have just said, mm, not my thing? Mm -hmm. um, well, thank you again for having me. Uh, I am probably best described as a career civil servant. So I've been in the civil service for 16 years now. Um, but actually, I think my journey starts when I was about 16 years old and I joined a political party. My parents were uh, quite active, not politically with a capital P, but they were always very encouraging of keeping abreast of current affairs. And I joined a political party and I got quite involved in that. Um, up until that point, I'd been full on trying to pursue an art career. Mm -hmm. did an art GCSE I was going to do my art A levels and then and then um, something piqued my interest in politics uh, and instead I changed tack and I uh, went to study government at the London School of Economics which as you know has quite a, a, a strong political underpinning to it and while I was there yeah, I um, well. yeah absolutely. definitely um, and I was encouraged to go and intern for a couple of uh, members of parliament um, in Westminster down the road, which I duly did. Um, and then uh, I decided to take it a step further, actually. And um, in my final year of university, I stood for parliament, mm. which was an amazing yeah. privilege. Yeah. Um, and something that I look back on. Um, and, and part of me thinks, you know, gosh, the audacity of youth mm. to think that, you know, I, I could I could go for that age 21. Uh, and another part of me is immensely proud that I did it. Um, and it was a great, a great experience. Uh, I was the youngest candidate in the country for that general election. Mm -hmm. So I got to do uh, both local and national media. Uh, um, but I, I, I stood uh, for Parliament. I didn't win. I wasn't expecting to win. Um, but it was also during my, my finals year at university and the university was incredibly supportive, mm -hmm. uh, but my, um, my, my degree exams were a week after the election. I scraped to 2-1 okay. and of course I then missed the milk round. So all of my fellow students had been um, getting to know all of the different options available to them, including the civil service. And I'd missed all of that. So I was a bit stuck because um, the party that I had stood for were very keen that I up sticks and move to uh, a, 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 what they call a target seat where I might be able to win five years later. But, you know, age 21, I didn't want to leave the city. So I, uh, I, I went to a temping agency and I said, what have you got on your books? Uh, I'm interested in politics, ideally the civil service. And I landed this job in the foreign office, which I think now is actually pretty much unheard of. It's a very odd route in. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had an incredible boss called Peter Holland, um, and he uh, he he took me from one job to another. Mm -hmm. and I ended up in the Afghan Drugs Unit, um, which uh, at the time was um, the unit focusing on the conflict uh, in Afghanistan um, at the height of um, the conflict, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, and then I had this ability, uh, I had this opportunity to go out to Afghanistan and, and actually cover for somebody out there, um, which turned into a year long assignment. Um, uh, but it was it was an amazing experience. And 
I did it for about a year and I, 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 I loved it. And then I had the opportunity to go out again um, on promotion to work for what was uh, then called the Serious Organised Crime Agency to work with the police out there. Um, and I led a series of Afghan capacity building programmes for just over two years out there, um, which was a, a, a really challenging moment in my career, um, not least working with a government that was, you know, still in the height of conflict and a police force that, you know, was trying to deal with systemic corruption and um, what have you. Um, but I, I got to the end of that period and, and you know, I, I felt quite burnt out and I wasn't sure I wanted to stay doing foreign policy. So I then decided to, um, to your word, um, to, to go for a, a, a real pivot mm -hmm. into the domestic civil service where I then joined what was called the Prime Minister's Delivery Unit um, at the heart of government. I went from one extreme to another. Um, Sorry and to interrupt, I, then is this, is this transition, you're no longer with the temp agency, you're uh, an employee of the government formally directly? That's right, that's right. So at that point I was I was a, a fully fledged um, member of, of the civil service on a slightly more stable stable contract. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, the, the Prime Minister's delivery unit um, for people that may not have heard of it is a bit like an in-house consultancy. So it's a little bit like McKinsey um, or PwC where uh, you are you go into departments to try and diagnose problems that the prime minister is concerned about. So it could be, you know, the accident and emergency waiting time has um, gone up, or it could be, um, you know, that an infrastructure project is taking a lot longer and we're sent in to understand what's going on and then report back to the prime minister with a series of recommendations to unblock the, the delivery obstacle. Uh, and um, that was a really interesting job. Um, I did that for a couple of years and, and then segued into the cabinet office where I did a series of roles in um, the national security space um, and had two, uh, two children um, over the course of that period as well. I took two uh, lots of 12 month breaks, um, came back, did more national security uh, work. Um, and, 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 and then I, um, uh, Brexit happened uh, and we were all encouraged to find uh, roles supporting uh, that transition. Mm -hmm. uh, so I went to the Department for Exiting the EU uh, and headed up a new team called the International Agreements Unit, which was essentially trying to replicate on a bilateral basis all of the agreements that we were going to fall out of when we left the EU so you know everything from the the major trade agreements that the EU had with third countries agreements like whiskey agreements and mm -hmm. uh data sharing agreements and you know keeping planes in the air flying uh mm -hmm. most complicated job I've ever done um cataloging thousands and thousands of agreements analyzing them for their worth and then reaching out to third countries to try and replicate them it was it was an intellectual challenge beyond anything that I had um, dealt with before. Well, um, ladies but, and gentlemen, uh, uh, sorry to interrupt, but again, we're, today we have as our guest on the Caring Economy, Hannah Young, who is the Deputy Consul General for the British Consulate General here in New York. Stay with us one moment and we're going to take a break and then we'll come back to Hannah. So welcome back to the Caring Economy with Hannah Young today as our guest from the British Consulate General, where she is Deputy Consul General and my new colleague as head of comms. Hannah, uh, so there you were uh, doing all this major analytical work on policy in, an e in a, a Brexit moment. Uh, where does it go from there or what was next? Then um, managed to um, secure probably uh, one of the, probably a job that would be at the pinnacle of my career so far, which was to, to move into number 10, uh, to go and be the prime minister's uh, private secretary on home affairs. And which was a job that I sorry to don't know 10 number 10 is 10 Downing Street the the equivalent of the White House for the UK that's correct and and the Prime Minister at the time was Theresa May and then uh, Boris Johnson came in and I I served him for just under a year mm -hmm. um it was a it was a very hard job um I was responsible for 
all of those uh, thorny policies that prime ministers really don't enjoy talking about. It was it was such a privilege to work in that role. I I had coveted that job for many many years and had thought about applying for it on a number of different occasions and it had never quite been the right time mm -hmm. uh, and and you know it was hard I had a one-year-old and a three-year-old when I started in that job mm -hmm. um, but it was it was um, it was also just I felt really strongly that I wanted to prove that you can do those kind of jobs when you've got a young family I really didn't want it to be the kind of job that was off limits to people and you know it was hard and I obviously needed to get greater support around the house for my kids you know we got a nanny um, to help us but um, you know I was very clear that I wanted to make it work I had incredibly supportive bosses who said when I pitched to them that I would do things differently and I would try and work a bit more flexibly you know they they bought that and they they understood that and they got behind it Mm -hmm. um and 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 so you know and so I had a very you know very challenging but very happy uh two years in that environment um and now I'm here with you uh <laughs> in New York um which is it's awesome for me I hope so for you <laughs> definitely definitely um, um I, I wanted to just chime in on your uh the the leadership, the, the management managers you had at that time when you were raising a young family, it almost seems like you helped them be better prepared for today in a COVID era, right? Because you were you were juggling it all with Archie's, your husband's support, I'm sure. Um, but that willingness to do as much work or more and to do it in non-traditional ways or be open to that. I think probably helped you and your colleagues to be just more nimble. And that's one of the things I write about in the caring economy and about corporate mm -hmm. social responsibility. By working harder to raise the bar and become more, more responsible to your shareholders, to your employees, to your, um, your uh, consumers, you are exercising a muscle that will allow you to be more nimble when the unexpected mm -hmm. happens. Would you agree with that? Absolutely, absolutely, and you know we've we've seen that um, bear out over COVID, as you say, um, the fact that we have to work more flexibly now. It also, I think, you know, makes your workforce more more diverse and more inclusive, doesn't it? Because you're saying that actually, you know, anybody, regardless of their circumstances, can can make make the job work, mm -hmm. uh, and and you know we have the technology now. Um, to underpin that in a way that we, you know, perhaps didn't have 10, 15, 20 years ago. So mm -hmm. there really is no, you know, there really is no excuse now for not being able to offer that kind of flexibility to individuals. I mean, it obviously works both ways. You know, I was very conscious in number 10 that when the phone rang in the middle of the night and something had happened, I'd have to drop everything. And that happened. You know, I remember there was one occasion on a Sunday afternoon, we were literally about to walk out the door to take my children swimming and the phone rang and it was a terrorist attack. And I had to turn around and say to my kids, I'm really sorry, but we can't go swimming now. I've got to go into work and, you know, I'm not sure when I'll be back, but daddy's here and he'll look after you. Um, uh, that's astonishing. I can't wait to read your memoir one day. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, yeah. again, today we have on the caring economy, Hannah Young, who is the Deputy Consul General at the British Consul General here in New York, where I also, as of the start of the new year, joined as head of communications. Um, Hannah, can you tell us, um, as a woman in the civil service, having worked in these amazing, amazing assignments, um, what, what might you want men to know about gender in the workplace? It's a really good question and and I'm really glad that you've asked that question because actually I think more men should be asking that on a regular basis. Um, I've had the benefit of some amazingly supportive men over my career, um, particularly during those transition moments, um, you know, either moving into a new role or uh, getting a promotion um, or coming back from maternity leave. Um, I remember Kim Darrick, who um, mm -hmm. you may also recall as the ambassador out here for a period of time to the United States. Um, when I came back from maternity leave the first time around, I 
uh, I didn't have a role to come back into. And I remember calling him up and saying to him, you know, I, I really want to make my time away from my kids count. I really want to do a job that is meaningful mm -hmm. um, and that is important to you. Uh, he was the national security advisor at the time. And, and you know, he, he, he brought me back and um, he put me uh, in a team responsible for the UK's um, uh, response to the, the Russia-Ukraine crisis that was kicking off at the time. Um, <laughs> you have just done I, I know, I know. <laughs> Out of the frying pan into the fire, I don't, you know, <laughs> maybe I should have gone back and just done the whole nappy changing. It might have been a bit easier, but, okay. you know, it was really important. Um, and, and, and likewise, actually, I, I had another great male boss who promoted me into the senior ranks despite the fact that I was four and a half months pregnant and he knew I was going to go off very soon, mm -hmm. you know, for a 12 month break. And, you know, obviously we shouldn't be discriminating against women who are pregnant, but it happens yes. uh, sadly. Um, and, and so, you know, I've, 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 I've had some amazingly supportive men. I've also suffered, um, you know, as a result of sexism. Um, and, and so, you know, I think, I think there's something about um, giving women a voice Mm -hmm. You know, when you look at the table, when you walk into a room, I've been in those situations where, you know, the majority of men have been sitting at the table and the majority of women have been in more junior roles sitting around the side. And I think there's something about inviting women to the table uh, when they're not proactively uh, wanting to sit there. Um, and, you know, I think there's in that kind of scenario there's also the whole concept of stolen ideas you know I've sat in meetings with very senior men who you know I'm sitting there and thinking you've just made the same point that somebody else has made I'm not gonna I'm not gonna make that point now or you know you've just taken my idea and there's something about calling that behavior out and you know acknowledging um when a woman has a, a good idea and you know, is putting it forward. Um, you know, encouraging women to have a voice, a voice in the room. Um, I think there's something about proactively valuing female counterparts. You know, women are given less credit for tasks, I think, and women also give themselves less credit, mm -hmm. and that can sometimes create a downward spiral in terms of your confidence levels. Yeah, I want to poke at that a little bit. It's been my observation. Mm -hmm. that sometimes women are their own worst, uh, are other women's worst enemies in workplaces. It's as if, um, and it's not you. It's not just, as a gay man. I've seen this with gay people as well. It, once one rises up, how do they treat their peers? Do they leave them behind? Do they try and help lift them up as well? As well as lifting up other people. I don't think it's about favoritism. I think it is trying to get as diverse a a representation in an organization and lifting everyone up. Um, but have you found that some of the, um, the uh, misogynist is not the word I would want, but some of the, the, the difficulties rising as a woman in your career has been also slowed by other women? It's a really, it's a really interesting question. I, I wouldn't say slowed, but I think that sometimes there can be a tendency for women to overemphasize the the kind of male qualities that we think are the epitome of the best kind of leadership. Mm -hmm. That's the challenge. It's how you stay, um, you know, how you stay unique to you, how you stay true to yourself as you become more senior. Um, you know, when you're in a room full of men, of course, sometimes you have to lean in and be a little bit more, um, I don't know, elbows out than you might otherwise feel. Mm -hmm. But but I think, you know, staying true to yourself is really important. And, and I think that's where, you know, women can really help other women and provide that space as as they become more senior mm -hmm. um, to allow you to, to be yourself, but, but also to have the confidence that, you know, your voice is going to be heard and, you know, to, to sort of champion putting women forward um, in that way. I mean, the other, okay. sorry, Toby. No, please. The I other... was going to say the other, the other area that, that I feel very strongly about is, um, and we, we touched on it, but, you know, making it work for parents. And actually, that's not just women, you know, that's women and men, um, you know, giving, giving those opportunities. And, and I think, you know, to the, 
to the amazing response of Kim Darrett, you know, on my phone call to him, not just assuming that women don't want the difficult jobs when they're having those transition moments, mm-hmm. um, you know, particularly coming back from maternity leave, because I think, you know, that's where we see the gender gap at the most acute yes Mm -hmm. exactly and and so you know those moments honing in on really supporting women Mm -hmm. in that transition back to work um you know or any on any carer you know for Mm -hmm. that matter because it's obviously now not just women who bring up children thank goodness um (laughs) absolutely um so i uh i want to ask you a little bit about the private sector because uh Mm -hmm. you know you're we're working in government, uh, but it's my belief as I've written in the book that we need all hands on deck for these major issues of our time. So it's COVID or uh, diversity and inclusion and Black Lives Matter or climate, which we'll come to in a bit. So what has been your take on the role of the private sector in creating a better tomorrow? And what does success look like? So um, the private sector is is absolutely a force for good. Um, and I've had the privilege of being in the middle of the Venn diagram between the private sector and the public sector where, mm-hmm. you know, actually we're making policies, but ultimately they're being implemented by the private sector. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I was in Afghanistan, we very much relied on private sector support, both in terms of keeping us safe, to my comment about my two bodyguards, also through to supporting us in rolling out the right kit for Afghans, you know, helping provide the training um, to, you know, capacity build them. Um, when I've been working in the uh, in the criminal justice world, you know, a lot of our prisons are run by the private sector. It's a really, really hard job. Uh, and, and yet the private sector has exactly stepped in um, at, at the cutting edge of cyber um, and national security as we think about how we can support businesses and individuals staying safer. You know, a lot of the a lot of the technology at the cutting edge of that is is the private sector supporting the public sector in, in what it's you know what it's trying to achieve. And I think the beauty of having that partnership is that. You know, I think I think sometimes the private sector just has the the ability to innovate and take risks that we might not be able to do in the public sector. You know, partly because we have different we have different um, uh, f- we have a different framework. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we have a more political framework, for example, and and that provides the parameters for what we can and can't do. But when you collaborate with the private sector certainly in my experience, there is there is just a a different ability to flex and innovate. And as you said, Toby, you know, when you look at COVID at the moment, um, you know, my God, we've really had to rely on the private sector to help us understand how to get through this, to develop the vaccine, you know, to help distribute it. Um, You know, and that feels like the sharp end of the relationship between the two. So welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Caring Economy with today's guest, Hannah Young, the Deputy Consul General at uh, the British Consul General here in New York. Uh, Hannah, uh, I know climate is also very near and dear to your heart, as well as your husband, Archie's. Um, Tell us a little bit about that. How do you stay inspired? How do you how do you how do you build the, the campaign, so to speak, or the movement to a better tomorrow? Climate is, um, I think, the biggest existential challenge that we face uh, as societies, as individuals. And it's, it, it really scares me when I think about the world that my children are going to inherit. Mm-hmm. And I worry about their health. You know, I worry about um, the natural habitat. I worry that they won't have the opportunity to, to travel and to see you know, some amazing places. Mm-hmm. Um, I worry about food supply chains. And, and you know, I think if I look at the roles that I've had over the years in the civil service, you know, of course, decisions have consequences. 
and you 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 don't take your responsibilities lightly particularly when you work on you know topics like national security but actually there's a political cycle and every four years a new government comes in and you know they might change gear and shift and and that's generally okay mm -hmm. and yet when it comes to climate actually these decisions really matter and they really matter now because the time is running out and it's not just a case of trying something and seeing if it works and if it doesn't work pivoting away from it you know mm -hmm. actually we need to take action now it's also a fascinating and scary and challenging to think how we do that because again it's a topic that affects everybody mm -hmm. everyone has to play their part mm -hmm. from you know every single country in the world setting you know, more ambitious uh, net zero targets mm -hmm. through to businesses having their own approaches, you know, to sustainability through to individuals making lifestyle choices that they may not like, mm -hmm. but that will ultimately contribute to, um, you know, the world trying to slow um, uh, global warming. So it, it's, it's a subject that uh, I, I care about both from a professional and a personal perspective. Mm -hmm. um, what and are it's, the, uh, the initiatives that are uh, ongoing? I'm, I'm sort of still getting up to speed here, but I know we do a lot around uh, just awareness raising with panel discussions, partnerships, collaborations. COP is being hosted this year by Her Majesty's government, which is a huge opportunity in November to really help catalyze that change. Um, what are some of the things you're working on now? Yeah, so so there's an overarching objective um, and, and COP26 is a catalyst, but first off, we need everybody to be more ambitious in their commitments to net zero. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned, that's that's right from countries down to the sub-national level to businesses, um, even to, to individuals. So committing more ambitious uh, net, net zero um, plans is really important. In New York, uh, at the consulate, we're also focusing on um, finance and uh, we call it greening the finance and financing the green. Mm -hmm. So we want um, financial institutions to invest in, in greener solutions, mm -hmm. but we also want them to be leaders in their own right in um, their ESG commitments, in uh, their net zero plans. Um, so we're focusing very much on supporting um, supporting uh, those more ambitious commitments, supporting um, more transparent reporting of where the money flows go, because actually what we're finding is that investors are now asking the questions themselves and wanting to see how green portfolios are um, before they um, make decisions about where their money goes. So. Um, you know that's um, that's a, a big focus, and and then uh, we're also um, looking at other projects like transportation, zero emissions vehicles. The UK quite recently announced that we were going to stop selling new um, internal combustion engines by 2030, and we're very keen to support other countries and states, including here in the US, to make similar. Mm -hmm. commitments um actually this week gm has announced that they're going that direction and it sort of shocked the rest of the auto industry here in the states so it's exciting right it's starting to happen it is exciting and and actually to one of your earlier questions about the relationship between the private sector and government um zero emissions vehicles is a really interesting one where it feels like industry and government has played cat and mouse mm -hmm. for the last 10 years where government has set a slightly more ambitious bar and then industry have innovated and managed to meet that mm -hmm. and that has then allowed government to bring forward the level of ambition mm -hmm. and again industry you know catching up and and it's a really interesting case study in the relationship between the two yeah. um you know for the greater good i suppose my only other thought on climate change and it's something that our prime minister has talked about a lot recently is it's it's not just important for the environment it actually makes economic sense to be investing in this space mm -hmm. uh you know the the train is leaving the station mm -hmm. and you know coal is not going to be 
the thing to invest in for much longer. It's going to be green technologies. It's going to be green wind energy, uh, solar panels. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's encouraging people to understand that actually this isn't really a choice anymore. Mm -hmm. and, and how can we support you make that transition in a way that is just and in a way that continues to give people the livelihoods that they need, but also recognises that they do need to make that shift and they need to do that sooner rather than later. It becomes a competitive advantage. It also becomes a much more compelling draw for young recruits, for investors and for consumers. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's been a privilege today to have Hannah Young on The Caring Economy. She is the Deputy Consul General in New York. So Hannah, for our, our friends and followers who want to know more about you, the Consul General um, and its efforts, uh, all these things we've discussed about today, what's your, your Twitter handle? It's Hannah Young NYC. That's Hannah Young NYC. I would encourage all of you to follow this, this meteoric rise of my colleague, Hannah Young. I'm going to let you have the last word today here on the caring economy, Hannah Young. Um, what say you about the future and what gives you hope or inspiration or you could talk about the role of service, your word. Well, thank you, Toby. And thank you for having me on, on your podcast. It's a great privilege. I think people just need to challenge themselves on what they can do to support the environment. As I said, it's something that we all have a responsibility for and we all benefit from it on a daily basis. So I just want to really encourage your listeners to think about what they can do personally and professionally to support this effort because it really is a team effort. Thank you again, Hannah Young. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, a round of applause for my guest today, Hannah Young, Deputy Consul General for the Consulate General here in New York, Her Majesty's government represented in our own patch. Have a great day.